Hey Star Trek fans, Dan Gunther here, back with another episode of the Star Trek Picard Deep Dive, where I take a look at the Easter eggs, canon connections, and continuity bits in an episode of Star Trek Picard. This time, Season 3, Episode 8, Surrender. Let's take a look at what we found in this week's episode. As usual, Riker refers to Troy as Imzadi, and we get this amusing scene where Troy seems to be exasperated that Riker uses that word so often. Imzadi is a Betazoid word meaning beloved, and we were first introduced to this term in the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, Encounter at Farpoint. When Troy talks about Riker's changeling impersonator infiltrating their family on Nepenthe, she jokes that he was good in bed, bad at pizza. This of course refers to the pizza making that we saw in the episode Nepenthe in the first season of Star Trek Picard. At one point when contemplating their possible impending deaths, Troy says Kestra will have lost everyone. This of course refers to Will and Deanna's daughter Kestra, whom we met in Picard's first season episode Nepenthe. Kester was their second child. Their first was Thaddeus Riker, who sadly passed away at a young age. We finally find out what exactly has gone on between Riker and Troy since the death of Thaddeus, and it seems that Troy used her empathic abilities to sort of dull the pain of Riker's grief following the death of their child. This made Riker numb and unable to complete the grieving process, which is a very sad and, and tragic story of course, but I feel like Deanna's actions were kind of very much in keeping with things we've seen from her family before. My mind went back to when we find out about Loxana's first child, Kestra Troy, the namesake of Will and Deanna's daughter, who died when Deanna was a baby. And what Luxana did at that time was basically attempt to erase Kestra from her life, deleting all records of her and basically pretending she never existed. In much the same way that Deanna seemed to try and get past Riker's grief by pretending it didn't exist and taking it on for herself so that he didn't have to experience it. As Deanna says in this episode, she forgot the cardinal rule of psychology, which is that you can't jump to the end, you can't jump to healing with Without going through that grieving process. And I feel like that's very similar to the actions that Luxana took, as chronicled in the TNG Season 7 episode, Dark Page. Speaking of Nepenthe, we get this wonderful sequence where Will and Deanna basically hate on the setting of that first season episode Nepenthe, this kind of bucolic pastoral setting in which they lived. I love the way they describe it. Troy says that house, it's like it was designed by a cabal of retro prairie hipsters. And Riker complains about how the way the front stairs groaned at him and the fact that the house had a very judgy foyer. I really love this scene. I understand some people dislike it because it feels like the writers of this season are kind of taking pot shots at the writers of season one and that may be the case but I still felt this was very much in keeping with their characters. Troy herself desires a more cosmopolitan lifestyle in the city saying she misses people and Raktagino lattes. Raktagino is of course Klingon coffee that we were first introduced to in Star Trek Deep Space Nine becoming a staple drink of Benjamin Sisko and a few of his crew. Back on the Titan, we resume with Vatic having taken over the ship, and we get a very satisfying interaction between Seven of Nine and Captain Shaw, in which Seven says basically through gritted teeth that her name is Seven of Nine, asserting herself, pushing back against Shaw calling her Commander Hansen. Now we don't quite see the payoff yet, I think it's to come where Shaw finally does call her Seven of Nine, but to see Seven pushing back against that here was very satisfying. To see. We learn in this episode that admirals and high-ranking officers have an override codex allowing them to take control of Federation starships. This in theory seems to be a good idea, at least as far as Picard taking control of the Titan is concerned, but my thought goes to the number of times we've seen badmirals in Star Trek, most notably the next generation. I don't know that I'd want to give an Admiral Pressman or an Admiral Haftel that kind of power. Not to mention Rear Admiral Nor Nora Satie. Meanwhile, back on the Shrike, Worf has come to the rescue of Riker and Deanna, 
And as usual, we get the Klingon theme playing over Worf's entrance. It's almost become not even worth commenting on at this point, as common as that is. We also get this wonderful Worf and Deanna Troy reunion, which I loved. Worf brings such a great energy to this episode, talking about how he often thought of her empathic gifts during his self-evaluation, and Deanna feeling that that's wonderful, and Riker thinking that that's quite inappropriate. I love this because it seems to be a kind of acknowledgement of the past relationship between Worf and Deanna, and I love that they're kind of bringing that history in and showing Riker is a little bit uncomfortable with this, but still, it's all in good fun, and the changes in Worf's character, I think, can really be rooted back to things that he learned from Deanna Troy, and I think that bit of continuity is wonderful. Thanks to this interaction between LaForge and Picard, we have yet another instance of people hating on Chateau Picard. This has really become a great running joke through this season, and I kind of almost want to put together a compilation of all of the insults that Chateau Picard has received from various characters throughout season three. This interaction comes as a result of Geordi trying to determine whether Picard and company are changelings or not, asking what gift Picard gave him during his wedding anniversary on Rigel, to which Picard responds, a bottle of Chateau Picard Bordeaux that you claimed was too dry because your tastes in wine are pedestrian at best. This satisfies Geordi that this is in fact Picard. I also love the little bit of continuity in here that Geordi's anniversary took place on Rigel. We find out that he's living on Rigel in the alternate future from the TNG final episode All Good Things. Very nice continuity there. We get another revelation of what something from the closing credits means when we see this graphic of the battle being waged within the mind of Daystrom Android M510 between the consciousnesses of Data and Lore. This is directly from the closing credits, something we've seen since episode 1, and it gets paid off nicely here. Inside the mind of this android, Geordi has lifted the partition between Data and Lore, and a battle commences between the two of them. During this interaction, we see several artifacts that represent Data's memories and therefore his life. First of all, we have Sherlock Holmes' Deerstalker cap which was the hat traditionally worn by Sherlock Holmes, we see Data wearing it in the episode Elementary Dear Data from TNG Season 2. And in fact, audio from that episode is played as we hear Data and Geordi discussing the artifacts that represent Holmes' life. We also see Sherlock Holmes' pipe, which actually made its first appearance in Season 1 in the episode Lonely Among Us. Other items that represent Data's life include this First Contact Era tricorder, this holographic recording of Tasha Yar. We first saw this miniature version of the Tasha Yar hologram in the TNG episode The Measure of a Man. The pose she strikes in this hologram is a little different from the one we initially saw in The Measure of a Man. Another item that we see is a deck of cards representing the camaraderie and friendship that Data experienced while playing poker with his crewmates in many episodes of TNG. And of course, Spot, Data's pet cat, who was played by a number of different cats of different breeds throughout Star Trek The Next Generation starting in Season 4. Interestingly, Spot is referred to here as he. He was initially referred to as he as well in Star Trek The Next Generation before giving birth to kittens and and being referred to as she in season 7 of TNG. The best explanation I can come up with is that there are several cats named Spot that Data had over the years, and he was just very unimaginative when it came to naming them. On the bridge, Jack Crusher presents himself to Vatic holding this device, and I cannot be the only one out there, in fact I know I'm not the only one out there, who immediately thought of this scene from Return of the Jedi. Hey, Yotto. Because he's holding a thermal detonator! <laughs> <laughs> The battle between Data and Lore is won by Data, and we get Data reborn. I love this new version of Data, and part of me kind of wondered about Data wanting to die in Season 1. That is addressed nicely here, where Picard brings this up to Data, and Data says that that version of him is resting peacefully. But in the case of this Data, there is no place that he would rather be than here with his friends and colleagues. We also find out that he is now able to use contractions, because of course he could never use contractions before. At least we're acquainted with the judge, Captain. 
I'm an android. I'm sure he meant now. Data, you all right? Yes, sir. I'm fine. Also, when Jordy asks, how do you feel? Data replies, I feel... I feel... This very much reminded me of Lal in the season three TNG episode, The Offspring. This was the android that Data constructed to be his daughter and was actually mentioned a couple episodes ago as being integrated into this new android's neural net. I feel... What do you feel, Lal? A lot of people have commented on the fact that Vatic freezes in space and then shatters when she hits the Shrike, while we have seen other changelings living in the vacuum of space before and surviving. I wonder if it has something to do with the modifications that were made to her by the experiments done at Daystrom Station. I almost feel that bringing her closer to being a solid and more easily able to mimic solids has caused her to lose the ability to live in space. Remember Vatic did say that changelings that take on these abilities, exchange them for a shorter life and a great deal of pain. So I wonder if some of those abilities to quickly change or to survive in the vacuum of space have now been lost, given the new abilities that have been gained. I love the conference room scene where we get to see the crew all together, once again, gathered around the conference table discussing their options. This scene was lovely, and I even felt it was shot in a way very similar to a lot of those conference room scenes on Star Trek The Next Generation were shot. I do love to see this crew all together, including Data, working through a problem and trying to come up with solutions together as a group. It really filled me with that old TNG spirit once again. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the uniform that Worf is wearing in this scene, and we see four pips indicating the rank of captain. Now, this is non-canon, but we learned in the Star Trek Picard novel Last Best Hope by Una McCormick that Worf eventually became the captain of the Enterprise E, and I would love if that turned out to be the case in canon as well. We see that he holds the rank of captain in Starfleet, so it's entirely possible that he was awarded that post at some point. Only time will tell. I do hope we learn that this was indeed the case. So that was everything that I was able to find this week. Was there anything that I missed? Please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, of course, to the Patreon supporters for all of your help in bringing these episodes to you. I could not do it without you. Thank you so very much. To everyone else, as always, thank you so much for watching. It really is the best thing you can do to help this channel. I'll be back next week with the deep dive video for the next episode entitled Vox. Until then, as always... Live long and prosper.